Well, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me and everybody who's been working at it. This is a really great little conference. Um, I, I want to talk about um, a, a subject that's been dear to my heart for a few years called the zombie vortex instability, or ZVI, which we think may be important in planet formation and star formation and other processes in protoplanetary disks. Um, as we've heard throughout the, the many days of talks, something has to happen in a protoplanetary disk. You can't just have Keplerian flow. You need something so that gas that's orbiting around the, the, the protostar is going to fire its retro rockets, get rid of its angular momentum, and come on in and add to the mass accretion. You need some sort of instability or wave or turbulence. You may need coherent vortices since they're nice places for dust to accumulate and then possibly agglomerate into planetesimals. You got to have some sort of vigorous mixing to make chondrules so that when we have meteorites, we can understand where those chondrules and how they were formed. OK, so I want to give you a little bit of history of ZVI. Um, it, it, I feel like it's the black sheep of astrophysics at this point. Um, and so I want to go through some of the things. Um, it, it was originally challenged because it's a purely hydrodynamic instability. And, and, and when this came out, the, the conventional wisdom was, but there are no purely hydrodynamical instabilities in Keplerian types of disks. OK, so we'll come to that and just mention that in a moment. It was challenged because, oh, it, it's an artifact of the numerical method. It's a spectral method. Well, spectral methods are pretty good, but, but we reproduced it um, on grids, OK, using an Athena code. Uh, it was challenged because it was originally done with the anelastic equation of state rather than ideal gases, but we can do it in ideal gases. We do everything today with a spectral code. It's very specialized. It runs 160 times faster than Athena, so you can actually integrate to reasonably realistic times. Um, the two things that I want to talk mostly about today, though, are uh, people said, well, it's you've got to come up with some initial conditions because it's not a linear instability. It's a finite amplitude instability. Are they realistic? And I want to talk about that. And then finally, I want to talk at the end about, oh, well, you know, it's, got, it's not going to work because it's going to be damped by radiative damping processes. So I want to try to fight that one. I'm going to pull it out of its grave. Um, so th th I think originally people thought that um, the uh, hydrodynamic instabilities were not possible in protoplanetary disks due to Lord Rayleigh, who argued both from a linear and finite amplitude point of view that um, you're not going to be unstable unless you have the angular momentum per unit mass. Right? If it's got to be weighted toward the center of your disk, not at the outside, which is not what a Keplerian disk does. And so that suggests that Keplerian disks or sub-Keplerian disks are, are going to be stable. But, but his theorem only applies under very, very specific circumstances that a flow is barotropic. Um, and, and that means that they, they, the surface of constant density and pressure are the same, or that the special case of the fluid is constant density. And, and that's not the real world of a protoplanetary disk. If the, we didn't worry about baroclinic instabilities, we wouldn't have climate, we wouldn't have weather, we wouldn't therefore have NCAR, we wouldn't be here. So we need baroclinic instabilities. Okay, a lot of people, a lot of people have written down equations of motion that give you purely hydrodynamic um, instabilities in a, in a, in a disk that would, would not be unstable according to Lord Rayleigh. So there's um, stratorotational instabilities, there's mode coupling instabilities, uh, rotational insta convective overstabilities, which we've heard about, vertical shear instabilities, and I'm going to talk about this purely hydrodynamic zombie instability. One of the reasons, right, that people don't like hydrodynamic instabilities is they go back to this 1996 paper by, by, by Steve Balbus and others, which was, was great for its time, but, but they couldn't have anticipated some of the things. What, what they did was they looked at disks that had different ah, angular, velo angular velocities as you go out. So Q would, for, for a Keplerian disk, would be 1.5, and Lord Rayleigh would say that you have to have Q greater than 2 to be unstable, and if Q is going to be less than 2, you're just going to, your perturbations will go away. So as a function of time, and this is in years, and um, they put in some energy um, with some distribution, and they, they watched, oop, it all decays according to exactly what, what, Ke, what Lord Rayleigh said, and it grows also according to what Lord Rayleigh said. But, but they couldn't have anticipated some of the problems with the numerical experiment. They didn't have much greater resolution, very great resolution, not much more than about a 30th of a pressure scale height. They didn't anticipate that there are going to be some instabilities that are going to require being able to resolve that. The calculation stopped at six years. They didn't realize that there are going to be some calculations where it's, the energy is going to decay and not bounce up for 600 years. 
they, they did not anticipate that the, the spectrum of turbulence they put in was very unrealistic. It was a Gaussian profile, which most turbulence doesn't have. And that would kill off the effects of real turbulence. They didn't anticipate our clinic instabilities because they didn't put in vertical gravity. Okay, so it's a great experiment, numerical experiment, but it's not applicable to this. We found this instability, which we call the zombie vortex instability, for a number of reasons. By, by pure serendipity, which is the way a lot of discoveries are made. Um, we were doing simulations in an analastic um, protoplanetary disk, and we found things happening. And we couldn't figure out what was happening in that disk. The physics was too complicated for us, so we, we reduced it. The, we knew that we had a lot of rotation, we had a lot of stratification, and we had a shear. And all those time scales were of the, the same order, one year. So we simplified the problem into the simplest thing we could think of, plane coet flow between two plates or unbounded that was rotating, stratified, <coughs> shearing with a Boussinesque equation of state. <coughs> Excuse me. So here's good old uh, coet flow. I'm going to, it's a fluid problem. It's rather an astrophysics problem. <coughs> so the streamwise direction here is x. The cross stream direction is y. The shear is sigma. And this flow is neutrally stable. Okay, you can just calculate it. it's linearly neutrally stable. You put it into a rot rotating frame, you round the z axis is coming out, you rotate it, it's still neutrally stable. No growing eigenmodes, no decaying eigenmodes. You vertically stratify it in the, this direction coming out of the board with a brunt Weissler frequency um, in terms of either the density or potential density uh, gradient, and it's still neutrally stable. So, what's going on here? It's finite amplitude unstable. And we discovered that the thing that drives the instability are critical layers. Critical layers used to be taught 30 years ago in a standard fluid dynamics class. Now they're like a lot of things they're not taught. When you have a unidirectional shear flow, like what we just showed you, it's going in one direction and only a function of one variable, the cross stream direction. If you've got a neutrally stable eigenmode, if that eigenmode, there's a place in the flow where the eigenmode's phase speed matches the actual fluid speed, you can get what's called a critical layer where you can get um, a singularity. If you put in a little dissipation, the singularity is really, really big, but it doesn't go away. OK, so Kelvin's cat size are a wonderful example. They're not very important because it's really hard to energize. You excite them, and they just poop out on you. They decay. OK, but in terms of a, let's go back to sophomore year of mathematics, when you start looking at ordinary differential equations. If you have, a, say, a, an equation, it's just an ordinary differential equation, if you look at the coefficient of the highest derivative term, if that vanishes anywhere in the flow, in the region, then you can have a logarithmic or worse type of singularity. That is really what a critical layer is. The governing equation for stability is the, the, the vorticity perturbation equation called Raleigh's equation. And the highest order term there is second order. And the leading order term um, will become zero with the critical layers. If you don't have vertical stratification, what you find is that that leading order term is the unperturbed streamwise velocity minus the phase speed. So I'm using kx as my wave number in the streamwise direction, um, uh, or s is the frequency, um, and um, that's the term that vanishes. Great, but if you go, and just very simple math problem do, you add in vertical stratification and or rotation, you'll find that the, there's a second term. This remains that term. Um, this term remains, but it's multiplied by another term. So if this term vanishes anywhere in the field, then you can also have a critical layer. And this requires vertical stratification. And so you can actually locate, this is how we analyzed what was going on in the more complex geometry. At a location y star, that term vanishes. That's where our critical layers will appear. If the velocity is simply a linear function of the cross stream coordinate, then you can solve for the location. It depends upon the frequency, the brunt weissler frequency, the shear, and the wave number. OK. And so at these critical layers, something happened. You got huge variations, huge inputs, logarithmic, in the vertical velocity. And you had to have the way that's set up, a derivative in the vertical velocity. OK, so um, if I look at the vorticity equation by taking the curl of governing equations here, there's the usual advection and stretching. But there's this growth term that depends upon this partial vz, vertical with respect to z, which is now infinite, times the Coriolis parameter in the shear. And that's what's going to create a vortex layer 
then that will go linear to the unstable on you. So that was the mechanism here. The energetics doesn't come from the perturbation. Like most shear flows, you've got a shear profile. You homogenize something, you go to a lower energy state in the primary flow. The difference between the homogenized state and the original state, that's a huge reservoir of energy that drives the flow. And that's what happens here. So it's acting like a normal shear flow. So um, I can rewrite things. My, my streamwise direction is the character length and streamwise direction divided by some integer. Um, and if I non-dimensionalize, I can figure out where my, 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 um, the critical layers will be. It turns out the frequency of the most interesting and fastest growing ones are always zero. So the critical layers are located at you know, m one. So in these dimensionless units, you get the first harmonic at one unit, the second harmonic at half a unit, and the next one at third a unit, and so on down the line. So here's my plain coet flow that I showed you. Let me turn it on its side that makes it astrophysical. Here's my star over here. Here's my streamwise direction. Um, and so let me show you by stretching out. Here again is my streamwise direction, my radial direction around the disk. Here's my cross stream direction. I've got a little perturbing vortex. It's finite amplitude instability in a plane above what I'm showing you here. And at m equals 1, you get the m equals 1 harmonic. There you get the next harmonic and then the third one. Things grow in time. They roll up through vortices. You produce new shear layers. And these guys then energize the next critical layer over. And it marches across the system like a zombie attack. OK. OK, so let me show you the movie. What? Zombie. They march across dead zones. Come on. Don't you know? Dead zones. Zombies. This paper was submitted on Halloween. OK. So here it is. The, the actual computational domain is over there somewhere. It will just do this. What you're looking at is the vertical vorticity, which will have a Rossby number always of about unity. This is an integrated very long, but it will, I'll show you a much longer integration in a bit. It's sustained. It keeps its um, Rossby number about unity. All right. Um, so this had um, noise as an initial condition is what astrophysicists want to see. They don't want to see some initial time t equals zero vortex there saying, OK, I'm going to perturb the system. They like to see noise. They like to see Kamigorov noise. OK, we shall deal with that. Um, it's, not, I remember, it's not a linear instability, so you have to feed it with something. How big does that noise have to be? That's an interesting question. Um, most instabilities in shear are finite amplitude instability. Pipe flow, your classic one, it's a finite amplitude instability. It is not a linear instability. Most instabilities, though, most instabilities, shear instabilities, um, the, the shape of the instability you know, it matters, but how much oomph you put into it is what really matters. It's got to be above a critical amplitude. Normally, that amplitude is in velocity or energy. These guys, we tested lots of experiments, it's vorticity or entropy, and that makes all the difference. OK. Suppose I have an initial noise of a system that is say, and it has an energy spectrum, E of k, of some constant times k to the minus some power, like k to the minus 5 thirds, would be comma Gorov. OK, so if it, that kind of spectrum, if you integrate over little channels, you see that the RMS velocity of any particular wave number k scales with k as 1 minus a over 2. And if I think of the RMS velocity of eddies of size L, it will scale as 1 minus a over 2. So for Kamigorov, the velocity would go as the length of the eddy to the 1 third power. The, all the velocity and energy is the big scale, and you fall off as length to the 1 third. But the vorticity is the derivative of that. So the RMS vorticity goes in a different way. For k to the minus 5 thirds spectra, it goes as the length to the minus 2 thirds power. All the vorticity and entropy is at the small scales. All the energy and the velocity is at the big scales. So for that index between 1 and 3, at least that statement of what is said is true. OK, so we did a number of experiments where we said, let's take our system. Now we'll do anelastic. We'll do all the stuff that you want to do for protoplanetary disk. Instead of plotting turbulence the way normal people would do, I'm going to do it logarithm of not the energy, but the root main square of the vorticity um, versus the log of the wave number. So we said, let's put in a whole bunch of initial conditions. And I want to show you that it's really that, that maximum vorticity determines whether this thing goes. So the first thing we did was we put in an initial condition. This is the spec these are the spectra of the initial conditions as a function of wave numbers. So we first did this dotted line here. 
And it didn't go unstable, because we figured out for this noise that there's a critical amplitude you've got to have of the initial vorticity to fire anywhere in the flow, both in wave number space or in physical space, would do it. OK, so if I change the constant in front of e sub 0 times k to the minus 5 thirds, I would just translate this guy downward. And I'd have this. He doesn't, trip. he doesn't trip the flow either. But if I tripped it, moved it upwards, the constant in front of it, I would get over that. And this fills the system with turbulence. Pardon me? Yeah, oh, yeah, that's my Coriolis parameter, yes. Two times the, the angular velocity. Um, so it's a very waspy number. Okay? So, so, but you don't have to change just the amplitude. You could change the spectral index. I could make it sharper. So I could have this dashed line here, and this has a different, free, different spectral index. I could design it so it had the same energy or velocity at the small scales that this guy does. So it's not, the, the instability doesn't depend upon the amplitude of the velocity. It will depend upon the vorticity, because this guy over here, even though it had the same velocity as these blues guys do with the, with the large scales, its vorticity peaks up over there. So there are many ways with a spectrum to trip the flow. This guy over here is the resolution of my calculation. This, in this case, resolution has another meaning other than just resolution. I could spend more money and use more Fourier modes and go out farther. So if I did that and changed my resolution to this, this k to the minus 5 thirds guy, which was stable before, he passes through. If he gets through, he wins. He becomes unstable. Well, a protoplanetary disk, the resolution there is going to be the Kolmogorov length scale, which is humongous because, as you know, it goes to the, the, uh, the wave number of the Kolmogorov well, scale is the, is the Reynolds number to so three quarters power. It's way over there somewhere. So you can have this guy get above the red line and, and move the whole thing way down. So at the small scales, there's not much energy at all. So in fact, you can just do some simple scaling and show that the critical Mach number based on the velocity at the biggest scale, to trip this thing, you'd have to go to the Reynolds number of the noise to the min minus one and a half power. So if your Reynolds number of the initial perturbation is you know, 10 to, the, 10 to the 14th, then you need 10 to the minus 7th Mach number. Yeah, it's a finite amplitude instability, but you don't need a heck of a lot of amplitude to trip it. OK, so I just wanted to um, tell you that. So let me show what a picture of this might, looks like. So this is a simulation of the vertical component of the velocity. The vertical uh, direction is coming out at you. Um, and um, uh, the cross stream direction is, is the horizontal axis. And um, you're, the, this is the initial flow. Remember, the vorticity is all in the smallest scale. So when you're seeing this picture of the vorticity, you're basically looking at the resolution size of the calculation. So what happens when you, tur whoop, when you turn this guy on, uh, this, this, no, this is going to be anelastic, but with constant brunt by silla frequency. Okay? Um, and I'll rel get rid of that. Hmm? And it's a shear flow. So it's, it's shearing at you like this. So you're seeing vortices coming in and out of the plane because the shear is like this. This is the cross stream direction. It does, a re it does an inverse cascade to get from very small amplitudes, trips. That is the length between the critical layers that we predicted. Blue is cyclonic, red is anticyclonic. You get these regular strips. And it seems to know the right length. It, somehow, some memory of the critical layer spacing is kept in the flow. It's damped at the top and the bottom because this is not a 3D box of turbulence that's periodic. There are real boundaries up here, and we damp the boundaries. So I want to put it, be honest here and show the boundary damping. All right. Um, so, um, so now let's relax the approximation that we've got a constant brunt Weissler frequency everywhere. Let's look at a protoplanetary disk, which has got no stratification at the midplane because it's symmetric. The gravity increases linearly from the midplane. Vertical gravity increases linearly as you go away from the midplane. Okay. So let's um, look at um, for for some particular um, if we do some particular study where we fix like we had the previous one where we fix the the ratio of the brunt weissel frequency to the uh, angular velocity, we, we find that there's a critical value. It's got to be greater than 1.2 and less than 4.2 to be unstable. If you're not in that range, you're not going to be unstable. So I'm going to call that a local condition, 
that you need to trigger instability. So in a protoplanetary disk, this trigger is never going to be satisfied near the midplane, but between maybe 1.2 and 1.5 pressure scale heights above and below the midplane, this instability will be triggered. We say the flow is susceptible there. So the analogy I like to think is a forest. If I, if I drop a match in a forest, there's a lot of places that are not susceptible to bursting into flame. But there are per places in the forest that are susceptible of just bursting into flame there. Okay, so one and two pressure scale lights above the, the midplane, we are susceptible, we'll burst into The question is, that place that wasn't, well, will the, once the flames get gone, will they go sweep through the rest of the forest? And the answer is going to be yes. Okay, so I want to show that, that, that yes, that under most places where, where, where star and formation, planet formation are important, what those radii say between 4 and 30 AU, this is going to go about one or two pressure scale lights above and below the midplane, and then it's going to, 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 to fill in the midplane. The other question is, if you put in um, dissipation due to viscosity, Newton, whatever, um, does that damp the flow? What happens in a real protoplanetary disk? We've got not only uh, the brunt weissler frequency is functional, but you've got damping. Well, viscosity is too small. Really, friction is not relevant in something without boundaries. Um, and and you, you're going to have thermal damping, and that thermal damping will depend upon whether you are optically thin or optically thick. Well, the critical, we've done lots of tests. The only part that's going to damp out the flow are those fragile, thin critical layers. You can work out by asymptotic expansion how thin the critical layers are. They're about 10 to the minus 4 of a vertical pressure scale height. And you can work out what the wavelengths are of, the, of infrared photons, and they are much, much longer than 10 to the minus 4 H. So that means if I've got a critical layer there, and I've got a photon that wants to carry energy out, it's going to get out of the critical layer before it's ever going to scatter by far. And therefore, you want to do optically thin. Optically thick damping is not relevant for this problem. But you do have an important question of are you in thermodynamic equilibrium locally? In other words, um, are the dust in the disk and the gas the same temperature or different? It doesn't really matter how different they are. You want to know what the cooling rate is, the difference is between if it were in local thermodynamic equilibrium and if it weren't. So there was a calculation that was recently published just assume that you're in local thermodynamic equilibrium. And the cooling time for that is very quick. It's about a 300th to a thousandth of a year. And that will certainly damp this flow. But if you, the way to go find out whether you're, whether you're non-LTE or LTE is you actually do the problem. Right? There's a two-stage process. The gas is too cold to cool by line cooling. So it collides with the dust, gives its energy to the dust. The dust then radiates it away as a black or gray body. So you've got to write down two coupled equations, the temperature of the gas the temperature of the dust, right? This is their heat capacities. There's a rate at which you're losing energy due to collisions. There's a flux of energy between the gas and, and, and the, the dust. And then for the dust, there's got the positive of that, and then you radiate it away. OK, so often people write these things in terms of the gas cooling time, which is defined in terms of the, of the flux rates and the radiation cooling time. And, and when, so you then have to solve a two by two matrix to find out what the eigenvalues are. But let me just point out. These have got really different range of time scales. The gas cooling time is really slow for typical places, one pressure scale height above and below the disk. This is the dust size. We don't, we're not dealing with uh, monodispersed dust. We've got some spectrum. Some people like the, the, the probability of having a dust particle as, as the radius to some power minus s. If you're um, uh, so the, the, the standard, one, standard one from the interstellar medium is 3.5. Observers like more like 3 and, 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 and 3.25. And when you do the calculations, um, you've got to average over the ensembles. And it turns out that the area the, that is the radius of a dust particle, and it's not really what it is. It's really the expectation of the value of the radius cube divided by the value of the radius squared, which is a known property in condensed matter physics. And you can work it out. So our dust spectrum goes between about 0.1 um, microns and anywhere from 1 or to a tenth to, a, to 10 meters. Um, and, and it turns out this quantity over here for a spectrum of 3.5, it just turns out to be the square root of the smallest dust grain size times the largest dust grain size. The smallest dust grain size we don't know, but it's irrelevant. Once you get below a tenth of a micron, there's no emissivity, so just forget it. The big guys, we have no handle on. 
the, more you, the bigger you make your dust grains, the more you can hide your mass because they don't have much area comparatively. Okay, so it depends upon the usual quantities in the standard disk. And when you work it out, you find, in terms of these time scales, that uh, the non uh, local thermodynamic equilibrium time. Right? This, this should have a plus or minus here because it's got two eigenvalues in the system, but you only care about the longest eigenvalue for your cooling time. Is is would be the exact time scale you would calculate for these same properties if you assume that you were in local thermodynamic equilibrium, plus the cooling time of the gas. This guy is around one day. This guy is around a year to ten years. This guy wins. The cooling time for most of the disk that's relevant is greater than 10 years, which means you do not damp at all. Now, the question was, well, if you have damping and not damping, you know, does the damping just say yes or no, you go, or does it affect the final flow? And the answer, it, it's pretty much, it tells you whether you go unstable or don't go unstable. But once you go unstable, you look at the time evolutions. You can't tell what was damped and what wasn't damped. So let me just uh, try and quickly end with, um, we, we took several different um, possibilities for what our protoplanetary disk might look like. These guys have different spectra for the, for the dust distribution. This is three and a quarter, this is three and a half, this is three. Um, here we have different sizes for what the maximum uh, uh, dust size is. This is a tenth of a meter. This is our speed spot. I'll look at this guy in general. But the purple lines here, which are not very visible, give you the log base 10 in units of one over the Keplerian angular velocity of the cooling time, and the black lines are the, the, are the cooling times, if you do it non I'll tell you. And in most places, they differ by at least a factor of 1,000. So being non lt really matters when it comes to the cooling. Um, if the dust settles, you have even a longer cooling time, because the dust scatters are all that going to get you cool. For, we, um, Jeff showed one last time about um, that's based on an alpha model, but there's several ones over here for the top. Over here, for example, says that the, the gas and the dust have the same scaling height. This says that the dust is half the gas scaling height. This says that the vertical scale height of the dust is a quarter. Here is one in terms of settling time, how long you've let it settle, and so on. So let me just say that very quickly, that, um, that under where the gray curve, any place where the gray curve is under this red line, basically our numerical experiments show that you explode into turbulence everywhere. What does the turbulence look like? And then I'll basically stop. Here's an initial condition, kind of like the initial condition. It's just um, Commodore of turbulence. You're looking at the vertical component of, of the vorticity. This is the vertical axis. This is a streamwise direction, cross stream direction. After about 300, 600 years, it looks like this. This is the part up here, about what above and below one and a half pressure scale heights, where you're locally susceptible due to the, brunt, the stratification frequency, stratification or brunt frequency being big enough, and also having a, a good cooling time, uh, long enough cooling time. This is so um, these are saturated out, but the red and the blue are basically Rossby number of unity. Um, there's not much happening at the midplane, which is where all the mass is, where you'd want to have things happen. But after 1,300 years, um, you fill in the midplane. It's not quite as intense, but nearly so. Then later, it becomes nearly a laminar banded structure, and it goes back, and it's going to be intermittent. So let's look at the movie. We look at the movie, and streamwise direction, we've got inverse cascade up to the critical amplitude you need to, to trigger the instability. Whoop, you've triggered that instability locally, then it's going to send an inertial. Um, shearing waves into the disk midplane, then a front of turbulence is going to come in. It won't look exactly like the turbulence that's out in the zombie uh, susceptible region. And it's going to go back and forth and back and forth. This movie is only 2,700 years. Most calculations, like we saw the one at the beginning, were like six years. We've gone to 10,000 years on this. This is self-sustaining turbulence with Rossby numbers of order unity. So let me just skip to my conclusions and say, the zombie vortex instability is a finite amplitude, purely hydrodynamic instability that fills the planet-forming regions of the, of the disk with large 
amplitude turbulence. We were doing shear and sheet calculations centered around run radius. We don't, which is we saw that, that, that the forest fire, when you drop the match, will go into the mid plane. We don't know if this will actually go into other radii that were, might have been stable by this. So we want to do a much thicker annulus in the future. It's not an artifact of numerics or analytic equations. The initial condition is that you can trigger it. Kolmogorov turbulence is fine with a really, really small amplitude for its Mach number. It's robust with respect to radiative damping because it's optically thin, and it's not locally in thermodynamic equilibrium. Um, and, uh, okay, and, and basically, there's a lot of questions. We don't know because we've been trying to prove for the last several years that this flow is real. It's not an artifact. Now we've got to test it, right? Does it produce acoustic waves? Does it transport angular momentum? Does it allow star formation? Does it, does it accumulate dust? Does it agglomerate them? Does it mix things in the way that, that is, makes sense for chondral formation? Um, what if, when you start competing this, what if, what if I've got convective overstability somewhere? What if I've got vertical shear instability? You put these together, do they help each other out, hinder each other? Does one of the wind? One, are there any observable consequences with radio telescopes or with um, you know, the, the James West telescope if whatever flies? Can we see anything? That's a really good question. And then we're not quite consistent. To, to work out what the cooling time is, we assume that the dust is there or had settled somewhat. But if we've got turbulence, we're going to redistribute the dust, and therefore we've got to redistribute the cooling times. So I'll leave it at that, and thank you very much for your attention. Um, so I would like, as you might imagine, I would like to get back to this uh, question of LTE versus non-LTE. Um, if you do the, the calculation of the time needed for the gas to thermalize with the dust, you find at 1 AU a time scale which is around five minutes. Um, that's a reason why um, people like Eugene Cheung and Peter Goldreich assumed thermodynamic equilibrium and LTE in their thermal structure. That is why everybody doing uh, radiative transfer simulation used uh, the dust opacities uh, and assume LTE. Um, and that the reason is because uh, the time scale five minutes is much shorter than anything you can actually do in these models. And now the, the ZVI uh, limiting time scale, so the, t the cooling time scale below which it disappears is around a year. So I don't see why one should not use the LTE approximation to check whether or not a disk is in the regime of ZVI or not. OK, well, wait a minute. What, what, OK, so there are a couple things you put together. First of all, the way to find out whether you're dealing in, in, in the non-thermodynamic equilibrium or the thermodynamic equilibrium state is to actually do the little two-by-two two matrix calculation using the equations to go back to Hollenbach and McKee. And um, I'm throwing me out of here. Because in the limit that you're in thermodynamic equilibrium, the, the, the temperatures are the same. The, the formula that you get for non-LT reduces exactly to the LT formula that you use. So if they're not the same times, that means you're not non-LTE. Look, I'm not an expert in radiative transfer, but I can read the papers. And, and I wouldn't have submitted this if I didn't first go to Chris McKee and said, is there a problem there? No. Go to Steve Beckwith. Is there a problem there? No. Go to Mike Scholl. No. I went to as many experts as I could think of of radiative transfer and said, is this true? Is it non-LTE? And no one said no. Oh, we can talk later. I suggest you send an email to What's happening? This is like a good it should work. It does not work. This works. No, but it does not work. Turn one. I don't know. So we need some technical help. It's, uh, we push this one. We did that. Yeah. Well, I don't know. <laughs> It doesn't pick it up. No signal. Ah, okay. Okay, no. It's gone black. We killed your yeah, computer yeah, yeah. at least. 
ואז יהיה קפיצוץ גדול. תודה לספיקר עוד פעם. אני פורגוט פה, סורי. אוקיי, תודה. 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 Uh, state and uh, now quite problem I became uh, to develop uh, some theories to uh, study um, general properties of plasma in such type of astrophysical objects like uh, like neutral stars like uh, sun like disks and like uh, tightly locked exoplanets which may have ionized atmospheres. And uh, <coughs> there are two different communities. Astrophysicists consider uh, plasma astrophysics to study uh, all these objects independently. At, in plasma community, uh, they okay, consider plasma astrophysics like a new branch of physics of plasma, which is developing some new uh, direction related to studies of large-scale flows in plasma, like is done, similar like is done in geophysical fluid dynamics. So <coughs> my, my interest is, of course, general properties of large-scale flows in plasma. Uh, especially, I became interested in this uh, after having and finding two very interesting publications about observations of Rosby waves. First publication was done by McIntosh and his team. Second, Moran, Rizon, and his team. So, a few words about my presentation. Uh, of course, uh, first normal high scale model, which comes in mind, is shallow water approximation extended for MHD. Uh, I will talk about shallow water approximation with, uh, in MHD with external vertical magnetic fields. Then, of course, I will talk about beta plane approximation, again, in vertical magnetic field. And we will see what kind of linear theory can be developed, weakly nonlinear theory, and parametric instabilities due to different nonlinear phenomena. And uh, to the end, I will shortly <coughs> describe our recent results about two-dimensional magnetic hydrodynamic dynamic turbulence on beta plane uh, about, uh, and zone of flows in MHD turbulence. So, <coughs> MHD show about equations. MHD show about equations have long history. Uh, they are widely used in uh, solar Tahoe line, but without, of course, external magnetic field. And also, this MHD show of water equations in uh, um, toroidal field was also widely used by Tumuri Zakarashvili, who is chairman now, to study Rosby waves. And uh, we are trying to Uh, extend this shallow water theory in presence of magnetic fields. This is not difficult. Uh, shallow water equations are easy to uh, derive uh, because you just consider your <coughs> stationary conditions in vertical, you neglect vertical approximation, and you just keep your uh, horizontal velocities, and you have this shallow water equations with uh, conditions of zero uh, non-divergence non of magnetic fields. Extension to uh, uh, in presence of external magnetic fields is also not difficult. It's simple algebra. The only problem is how to write correctly uh, conditions for non-divergence of magnetic field. 
<coughs> These are uh, derived equations for uh, internal water approximations in presence of external magnetic fields. First, you can see some extra terms due to external magnetic fields. This is much simpler. And very unusual thing is uh, conditions of non-divergence of magnetic fields. If you want to have magnetic fields with zero uh, divergence, you can't neglect vertical magnetic fields. So you need to keep in your equations, at least in these equations, uh, third component of magnetic fields. So shallow water proxy. And of course, these conditions for uh, non-divergence of magnetic fields are separated from uh, all these equations. First, one, two, three, four, five equations. So my outcome is that if you want to write shallow water equations, you need to put third component of magnetic field in conditions of no, in non-divergent free conditions. Indeed, you don't need third component to develop theory because these conditions as ever uh, are uh, okay separated. So you need them when you want uh, okay to solve sometimes uh, on computers this set of equations. But you need to understand that magnetic field is uh, three component and third component uh, is uh, can be computed or derived having first two component. So magnetic field is axisymmetric. Uh, okay, this made some difference change okay, in dynamics. Uh, if you linearize these equations, you will get uh, three, uh, two type of, uh, you will get general dispersion relation and two type of uh, linear waves, magnetopoincare waves, which are, uh, okay, uh, rotationally magnetogravity, magnetogravity waves subject of rotation, and you have magnetostrophic waves, the dispersion relation, which in non-rotating case are Alfred waves. This is, uh, why this is interesting? Because we know from geophysical fluid dynamics that Poincaré waves don't have linear, uh, non-linear interactions. And a similar situation exists if you consider uh, uh, magnetohydrodynamic shallow water equations in horizontal field, in poroidal or in toroidal or in both. Uh, and question is, if we consider external magnetic field, could you have uh, uh, in uh, non-linear regime, uh, say, three-dimensional, uh, three wave interactions? Uh, OK. Uh, so that to understand about three waves interaction, you need to uh, analyze fast matching conditions. So you have dispersion relation for one wave, you have dispersion relations of the second wave. If this dispersion surface is uh, uh, intersecting, then you have uh, conditions for having three wave interactions. In our case of uh, external magnetic field, you may see uh, four type of fast matching conditions, which allow you uh, it three wave interactions. For three magnetopoincare waves may interact, two magnetostrophic waves, and one magnetopoincare wave may interact. Three magnetostrophic waves again may interact, and two magnetopoincare waves and one magnetostrophic waves interaction. So appearance of external magnetic fields uh, allows you. Uh, to have uh, four type of three wave interactions. Then if you understand this, you simply use multi-scale asymptotic methods so that to derive uh, amplitude equations for three wave waves. So it's very simple. You just use normal asymptotic expansion and you use, uh, uh, I would say, modulations, and then you use uh, slow and fast variables um, so, that, uh, so that to write three wave 
interaction equations or any nonlinear equations as compatibility conditions which makes all this asymptotic expansion smooth. So, as a result, you get in external magnetic field, you get three wave equations. So we got four sets of three wave interactions describing all these uh, situations which I mentioned when we discussed with fast matching conditions. So having three f f four sets of three wave interactions, uh, three wave interaction equations, amplitude equations are uh, okay, traditional. Um, they are general. Problem is how to compute and uh, compute interaction terms and interaction coefficients. So then you have three wave interactions and you have different parametric instabilities. First, of course, you can have uh, instability of magnetoponcare wave, wave. It decays into two magnetoponcare waves, and you can find all this growth rate and so on and so on that you need. And you can predict uh, decay, parametric decay of mag magnetostrophic wave into two magnetostrophic wave. Magnetoponcare wave also decays in one magnetoponcare. So all three, uh, four sets of equations give you parametric instabilities in external magnetic field. Of course, uh, if there exists magne parametric instability, it should exist uh, parametric amplification. So you have, again, four types of parametric instabilities, uh, parametric amplifications that is possible in such system. Uh, okay. Uh, then you can put, uh, yeah, this again, parametric instability, so I will not read everything because it's similar and trivial. Here are our equations in external magnetic field uh, for in better point approximation. Uh, first, I read about better point approximation in MSD from work of Temuri Zakarashvili. Uh, who use this in, uh, again in toroidal field to explain things in Tachokrain, and we do this in external magnetic field. And as you can expect, you have again magneto Rossby waves. These are our dispersion relations, which include uh, external magnetic field. Of course, we did this also. Uh, for uh, toroidal field obtained uh, the Karashvili's results. We did this for poroidal and for both toroidal and poroidal. And what is interesting, again, fast matching conditions in external magnetic field allows you and support for Rosby, magneto Rosby waves, three wave interactions. And what is interesting, uh, in for Rosby waves in beta plane approximation, you can have three waves interactions, both in vertical magnetic field, or if not vertical, in horizontal field, in toroidal and in uh, poroidal. So, and we obtained uh, three wave equations. They are again for these magneto Rosby waves. Again, equations are traditional chains are in interaction terms, so we got this all interaction terms in vertical magnetic field, and we got all these interaction terms in uh, uh, horizontal fields. And as ever, if you have if you have uh, three wave interactions, you expect to have. Uh, mm, parametric instability, and you, we found, again, growth rates for all these situations, both in vertical or in toroidal and toroidal, and we have parametric amplification of all Rosby waves. Uh, interesting situation in these nonlinear waves is that if you don't have vertical, uh, ax, vertical magnetic field, you may have uh, four wave interactions in uh, toroidal and poroidal fields for Poincare waves. And 
we obtained just on Friday these equations in the West, but uh, no time to think about. Next time I will provide these results. So this is about Rosby waves. And now I go uh, compressibility effects. Uh, show what equations. You can derive also uh, when you want to take into consideration uh, effects of compressibility. The only what you need, you need filter acoustics. Yeah, 10 minutes. Acoustic waves. And uh, you will have large scale, large scale um, compressibility dependence of uh, density on pressure. So we derived these equations. And what is good? Uh, the equations are similar to uh, non-compressible situation. The only, instead having uh, equation for uh, depth, we, we have equation for some parameter L, which is directly connected to, uh, to uh, H, to, to depth of surface. Yes, free surface. Okay, we got these equations, and what happened, we again did uh, um, linear uh, analysis, and we again did uh, better point approximation, and we again uh, found this uh, no dramatic change in dispersion relations. So we have similar effects uh, for like parametric instabilities for all this situation. Uh, uh, for Poincaré waves in external magnetic field and for Rosby waves both in external field or in presence of horizontal field. So, uh, okay, uh, of course, interaction coefficients are uh, depending on compressibility conditions, but physics is similar. And what is important in this uh, such type of equation, they may be useful in work which is doing Moran because he is computing uh, these eigenfunctions, but eigenfunctions, of course, are changed in presence of compressibility. And these are just linear waves for compressible, but we did, of course, nonlinear, and this will be published in December, already accepted. Now, if you was about uh, better 2D better point magnetic hydrodynamic equations. What we wanted to understand, okay, we know that in uh, uh, geophysical fluid dynamics, always in 2D exist uh, zone of forms. And we wanted to understand uh, what will happen if you put magnetic field. Uh, we wanted to understand because we read paper of Tobias about uh, Room of magnetic fields in uh, the hook line in presence of uh, uh, toroid or magnetic field, but we wanted to do a general part of again uh, astrophysical fluid dynamics just to study uh, decaying turbulence in such system. Okay, it's not it's difficult because uh, okay in Russia we're not only good hackers but we're also good programmists, so we did very simple code. Uh, uh, pseudo-spectral, uh, and we made computations uh, for MHD in the same code, comparing MHD and uh, not MHD cases. I will show first what is happening in non-MHD and then show what is doing magnetic field. Oh, you see, this is, these are two-dimensional uh, computations for uh, for neutral fluid dynamics and uh, you see zone of rows are formed uh, it's expected now I stop this and uh, now I consider what is happening in presence of magnetic field okay you see you will again in decaying turbulence you will again have uh, zonal structure, but what is very interesting is that these uh, zonal flows are uh, stable, but they are moving in vertical direction. 
This is because you have magnetic field. Uh, just to show no time, uh, magnetic field, uh, evolution of magnetic field in such situation. You see, uh, magnetic fields are aligned perpendicular to zone of flows because of uh, magnetic field freezing. Okay, uh, and uh, uh, what we are doing now, we have a lot of uh, results of our computations, and we want to understand how, and we see such phenomena, uh, in what extent this vertical moving of uh, zone of flows depends on uh, on magnetic islands. So because these magnetic islands uh, may collide, may give you uh, connections, and so on and so on. That's what we are doing. But when we got these results, we were shocked because we don't ex we expected to have zone of flows, but we can't expect that this zone of flows are, uh, are Vertically non stationary. Uh, ah, this uh, I am finishing. This, ah, uh, you see, uh, zone of flows uh, on, uh, in time for neutral, and there are zone of flows in presence of magnetic fields. What else we did in this work? Uh, we wanted to understand where this uh, uh, zone of flows are located. And of course, first idea which comes to extend. Uh, Ryan's criteria uh, to magnetic case. This is just exp uh, explanation how to derive Ryan's criteria, which was done by Valis. And uh, we extended this for non -magnet for magnetic case, and we got our criteria for uh, location in, sp uh, in spectral space, um, this uh, zone of flows. Uh, and what is happening, we analyzed our decaying turbulence and made uh, computations to see in uh, how far and how uh, our uh, expression predict uh, location of our zone of flows. And you see, well, prediction is more or less good. And finally, what we also did, since we were not satisfied this result, okay, first we were shocked that this can move, and first was to see if our code is properly working. But how to uh, check if work is, uh, our code is properly working? We decided to reproduce uh, results of Steve Tobias on, on uh, uh, or in presence of uh, in presence of uh, toroidal magnetic field, and we are very happy because we reproduce what was published, and we are happy to see that our code is properly working. This I just I repeat what is happening in normal hydrodynamics. You have a zone of flows, we see, and I will show you results. Uh, set up like was published in work of Steve Tobias because they observed that uh, if you change magnetic field and if you have faucet turbulence then due to alphenic waves uh, uh, zone of moves are uh, disappearing. So here are results, Tobias results, I show few. Uh, show that zone of flow exists for these parameters. And when you change B0, uh, you will have not zone of flows. So, no zone of flows. And then we were sure that our code is properly, and we submitted paper and which was published last week. Thank you. Your uh, 
calculation about how the magnetic field changes the Rhine scale. Is that is that a similar calculation to the one Pat Diamond and his collaborators? Uh, no, it's a little bit different. I know these co calculations because we take into consideration in order to know the time magnetic field because we want to, huh? You have uh, dispersion relation and you have, uh, when you consider Rossby waves, you can different Rossby waves. You can take magneto Rossby waves and you can take, so we did this for fully magnetic case. What he did, he did for, again, for Tachokmohen. But we uh, got information about this work after submitting and, uh, our work. So, but we know about this work. Okay, thank you. Thanks for a nice talk. I was just curious what breaks the symmetry when the, when the, when the magnetic field is moving upwards. What makes them move up rather than down? What, what's uh, I think it's... Uh, we expect, and what we see from our computations, magnetic ions, which may reconnect and we, which may be unstable. There are a lot of magnetic ions which we observe when we analyze magnetic fields. But there is no clear answer because we are still analyzing magnetic part. I think it could go equally well go down as well as up, or is there something that chooses, chooses up as the preferred direction? Because your system looks sort of, you know, it looks like if you reflected or you turn it around, you get the same system back somehow. Uh, I don't have answers on this question. It's homogeneous decaying turbulence. So. You've got a preferred motion. That's what I was thinking, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Everybody forgets about this. Great. Uh, so I have changed uh, talks with uh, Fred Gasparini, who was supposed to be speaking today. And he was going to be talking about uh, climate simulations of a sort in a deep, deep atmosphere. I'm going to talk about uh, climate simulations in our standard atmospheric uh, coupled uh, model system. And I want to talk about uh, uh, the problem of climate predictability and uh, whether or not we might have a case in the current version of our model of an almost intransitive system uh, in terms of climate. So okay, my outline is going to be as follows. I, I'm going to talk just about uh, what we've been spending quite a bit of time over the past couple years doing, which is uh, trying to bring along a new version of our community Earth system model. And uh, it will involve a couple of problems that uh, have evolved during in, in that time, uh, two of which happen to involve uh, the Labrador Sea. And the third, the other problem is something associated with aerosol, the aerosol indirect effect on clouds. And I'll explain uh, everything as we go along. Uh, bear with me. Uh, there's not going to be too, too much direct 
turbulence, but turbulence will be influential in uh, many of the, the problems that have uh, arisen. And uh, uh, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, what might be considered the, the greatest uncertainty in climate modeling and climate uh, uh, change predictions. Uh, and that is, according to the IPCC, at least the Intergovernment Panel for uh, Climate Change, uh, it's related to aerosol effects and aerosol cloud effects, OK? So aerosol effects uh, scatter uh, radiation, OK? So directly scatter uh, radiation. And that's this direct effect here. And even that's uncertain because uh, the impact of aerosols themselves on the radiation budget is uh, controversial. But two aspects of uh, another aspect of uh, aerosols is that they affect cloud radiative properties. And how they do that, do that is as follows. If you have a pristine atmosphere, then you form droplets in the cloud. And those droplets in the cloud can grow and become uh, uh, large enough to become raindrops. That's what typically happens in, in clouds. If you have a dirty atmosphere, one with a, quite a bit of aerosol, you have many, many sites to grow droplets on. And having a multitude of sites to grow droplets on, you grow very small droplets. Small droplets are very inefficient to, at colliding with one another. And because of that, uh, they tend to make clouds that last longer. Small droplets also have the effect of um, uh, being uh, much brighter in terms of their ability to reflect solar radiation. So the, the indirect effects of clouds and aerosol is something that we've been trying to model at NCAR for the last couple versions of our, our climate system model. All right. So this is our previous climate system model uh, and how we were going to go from the current version, our, our past version in 2015 to a new version in 2017. It is now 2018, and we just barely finished, uh, uh, got to this phase right here where we would begin running uh, so-called IPCC and CMIP uh, 6 simulations. So what happened? Well, what happened is we changed a great deal of the parameterized physics, including the boundary layer parameters in order to more faithfully, we thought, represent the effects of clouds and aerosols. Uh, now, our previous version did have cloud microphysics and aerosols linked with one another, but they had a very simple uh, TKE boundary layer formulation. And the, the important aspect of this is what's happening in a cloudy boundary layer. So the boundary layer parameterization not only has to do the standard turbulence parameterizations, but it also has to form clouds. And those clouds are then radiatively active uh, uh, within the Earth's radiation budget, or within the model's radiation budget. So these are the, the things that we've changed. We've changed all of our cloud microphysics and boundary layer parameterizations. Uh, uh, to a, uh, a parameterization called CLUB, which is a uh, moment scheme that uh, closes the moment equations f in the moisture budget using uh, a specified binomial or binormal distribution of um, moist, moist quantities and vertical velocity and potential temperature. So it links together very nicely the cloud-making processes and the rain-making processes of the boundary layer. But it's, uh, once again, just a parameterization of the kind of 
real turbulent boundary layer that forms real clouds and real shallow convection. All right. So basically, this is how CLUB works. Uh, it computes, it advances these prognostic moments in order, and then distributes them as a, as a PDF. Uh, it also closes the moment equations by using this binormal specification of the PDF and uh, only the parameters within the distribution of the PDF are allowed to change, not the uh, form of it. It has to be given by a binormal distribution. All right. So uh, I mentioned uh, 2015 we were finished using our old version of the model. And then we wanted to develop the new version of the model. And so we had a, a large team effort. Uh, I was part of the team. And uh, part of the team is to bring together a new version of not just the atmospheric model, which is what I'm going to focus on today, but also this, the, the coupled components, which involve the ocean, the sea ice, uh, river runoff, uh, land ice, and land surface. All right. No. So we started, uh, I'm going to talk about quite a few early versions of the model. We went from a working, uh, winter working group meeting in 2016 to a, a meeting in 2016, which should have been uh, the time at which we uh, were going to have a final version of the model. So uh, let's focus on this summer-June meeting in 2016. And at that time, we had a preliminary version. We thought it was almost ready at Breckenridge. But then suddenly, uh, we ran the model out. It was looking fine. And after 100 and 10 years, the Labrador Sea froze. Okay. Now, this is the original version of the model. This is the new version of the model. And you can see that the Labrador Sea is completely frozen. Now, you might say, who cares? Labrador Sea is a small part of, of the globe. It turns out that the Labrador Sea is responsible for driving the kind of convective turbulence that drives the overturning circulation in the Atlantic Ocean. So a frozen Labrador Sea cuts off uh, convection completely in, in, uh, in the uh, northern part of the, of the Atlantic Basin. And because of that, it cuts off the uh, meridional overturning circulation in the Atlantic Ocean, in the ocean. All right. So what happened? Well. Uh, the ocean went from a model which was too warm and salty to one that was too cold and fresh. So just the, the perfect conditions for forming ice in the North Atlantic, because uh, not only is the water cold, it becomes buoyant uh, water and will stay on the very top because it's fresher and fresher. And how does that happen? Okay. OK. Well, it happened in this case, in the first case, because we were putting a lot of river runoff and fresh water into the ocean when we were melting ice, et cetera. And so uh, the way you might do this in a climate model, and the way we did it was to uh, just dump it in the first few grid boxes in the ocean model. The, the river water would dump into the first few grid boxes nearest the outlet of the sea or nearest the, 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 um, the meltwater. And then the meltwater would become uh, much fresher in a few locations. And that was enough to, to allow the Labrador Sea to freeze in this circumstance. OK. So we, uh, excuse me, uh, we solved that problem resolve that problem by using a much more sophisticated model, making an estuary uh, box model in order to spread out the river runoff and the uh, ice melt into more than one grid box and, and uh, 
keep it, keep the system running stably. So we thought we had a solution come uh, uh, somewhere in the beginning of 2017. So in 2017, then, we decided to take a version that we thought was stable. And we uh, ran it out using in for a 20th century simulation um, using the old aerosol emissions, the old emissions from CMIP-5. So uh, the aerosol emissions that were used in uh, the 2012 um, uh, uh, CMIP, AMIP, uh, CMIP simulations and IPCC report. Well, updating the uh, protocol for this next run of model inner comparisons, uh, new emissions were, were run. And this is what happened when we put the new emissions in for the 20th century. So this is something close to the observed temperature record for uh, the 20th century. This is what uh, CMIP-5 emissions uh, produced. And this is what we were getting with our climate model. Not only were we not getting uh, much warming in the 20th century, we actually started, we actually ended the 20th century colder than we started, OK? So clearly, something was, was wrong somewhere in the, in the system. And uh, this happened to coincide, the, the elucidation of this problem happened to coincide with, once again, one of our June uh, meetings. And uh, uh, we made headlines in EOS. Uh, model builders investigate a puzzling malfunction in what's expected to be an improved version of the model. So that was the puzzling male function. Uh, so there were some problems with the original CMIP-6 emissions, but not enough to change the, the problem significantly. So we started looking at how, uh, uh, how where this problem was coming from was clearly coming from the new emissions causing too much low cloud in the boundary layer, okay, which is an aerosol uh, cloud interaction. Too much aerosol in the boundary layer made meant we had these long-lived, optically bright clouds in the boundary layer, and those boundary boundary layer clouds uh, uh, cause. Uh, reflected enough solar, solar radiation in the latter half of the 20th century that there was no warming in the latter half of the 20th century. So we modified our uh, cloud microphysics scheme by changing this exponent from 3, basically, to 2, minus 3 to minus 2. And that got us through this problem. So these are now the new simulations. Uh, uh, and this is this the shadows here. The, the shading corresponds to our older model, which we'd run with a 40-member ensemble to see what kind of uncertainty there might be in, in that temperature. OK? All right. So we're doing fine. We get, we get a nice global surface temperature that looks close to the record, and then warms dramatically in the last half of the, the 21st century. Uh, 20th century or the beginning of the 21st century. And we were willing to live with that uh, because we'd had so many other problems so far. And we were already basically a year behind. All right. OK, so um, we then turned to the second Labrador Sea problem. And what happened, uh, we had a version that we thought was doing very nicely. Uh, and then we were fixing some bugs in that version of the model. And all of a sudden, bam, after 100 years of simulation, the Labrador Sea blew up again. Froze, OK? All right. Now, in these simulations, uh, these dashed lines in here are all uh, uh, control simulations that we managed to uh, run three-member ensembles and get 
uh, reasonable simulations. But this did not always happen. And by the time we were ready to run, um, we got uh, essentially uh, a simulation that blew up in this fashion. So this is uh, before the kind of pre-industrial. This is after the lab C uh, freezes. And you can see how, how cold this, the temperature is and how fresh the, the water is in, in the Labrador Sea in the North Atlantic. All right. So what was happening? Um, we'd start the model using one of the members of that large ensemble of the uh, previous version of the model. And uh, it would go along fine for a while. And then occasionally, we'd get these freshening uh, outbursts. And uh, the uh, temperature, this is the freshening right here. And the uh, temperature would cool dramatically for a while, but it would recover. Eventually, we would reach a state from which it would not recover. Okay, Now, you can see the overturning circulation is decaying uh, linearly in time for 100 years. And so uh, while we stop the simulation once the Labrador Sea froze, you can imagine that the, lab that the meridional overturning circulation is going to become much, much smaller than it was uh, in the pre-industrial case. And so the surface temperature of the North Atlantic region, continental regions close to it, is going to change considerably. All right. So we'd go into some situations when we get weaker winds, weaker wind stress curl. Small, because of the weaker winds, we get smaller latent heat loss, smaller evaporation. And with smaller evaporation, we get these freshening incidents. And the freshening incidents were kind of slightly precursors. OK, but we could never pinpoint what came first. Uh, as hard as we tried. And so we tried to modify kind of the, the surface turbulent parameterizations, the bulk parameterization, to uh, minimize our chances of falling into one of these freezing things. And uh, we were fairly su successful. But I want to show you uh, particularly this box up here, because this shows exactly what I want to uh, emphasize for the rest of my talk, namely, these are three simulations. The dotted dash simulations are three different simulations. And of those three, one of them has a frozen uh, Labrador Sea. Okay? The difference between these simulations is a bit level change in the initial conditions. Okay? So a bit level change. All right. Now. The question is, has, was that just a long tuning uh, exercise, or is it a lesson in climate predictability? And now I want to go back to uh, a relatively old uh, monograph, short monograph paper of Ed Lorenz, who talked about intransitive systems, transitive systems, and almost intransitive systems. So transitivity is kind of ergodicity of the of the attractor. Okay, if you have a long uh, record from uh, one trajectory, it's as good as having all the statistics on the, traje on the, on the attractor. Um, intransitive systems might have multiple attractors, okay? multiple basins of attraction. And so if you take an initial condition that falls into one of the basins of attraction, uh, you don't even know there's another basin of attraction. You're not getting a representative sample. An almost intransitive system has long periods in which it spends uh, time in one basin of pseudo basin of attraction and then switches over to uh, the other basin of attraction. But there, these are long periods of time. So Ed Lorenz used an analog in a talk at NCAR once of doing of the 
the mechanical problem of billiards on a, on a dumbbell-shaped table. And you can imagine that if you're in one of the, the circles here, you can bounce around for a long period of time. It'd take you a while to get into this gap and then switch over to here. So, and depending on how thick uh, the, the, the bar between the bells is, uh, it, might, it would take you longer and longer uh, resonance time in each one of the, one of the, bell, the bells and one of the pseudo uh, attractors. Okay, so I'm going to contend that that's what is happening here. Now, you might say, well, this occurred only because you were at this special initial condition which might be highly sensitive to this freezing of the, of the, uh, uh, Labrador C, and it's in the adjustment to the new climate physics. But in the past, we've had similar behavior. This is the thermal haline circulation variability in one of our old, old versions of the coupled model. You can see we have hundreds of years, about 100 years in, in a low meridional overturning state, and another 100 years or so in a higher meridional overturning state. This is in a free-running climate simulation. Yes. Almost done. OK. All right. Uh, even a more recent version, um, the version just before the ver or two versions ago of our coupled climate system, uh, uh, we, we ran that with a uh, two degree atmosphere instead of a one degree atmosphere. And we got these very long-lived uh, episodes of high sea ice concentration, low uh, mixed layer depth, and low uh, uh, meridional overturning circulation. Now, uh, I'm showing you some force simulations with stochastic forcing, but those, these, these simulations were done to analyze, help analyze what was going on in, the, in that long climate running simulation. Okay. Now I want to show you a recent experiment that a college student from Colorado College, who was here as a summer intern, ran using the current version of the model, the model that was actually just released in June. Okay, So you start off with a uh, model state that has four times the CO2 of the, um, of the uh, pre-industrial uh, concentration of, of carbon dioxide. And uh, the student and the scientist, Claudia Tabaldi, who he was working with, were interested in how long it would take if you went back to pre-industrial concentrations of CO2, how long would it take for the temperature to recover? And so if you do it only after, this, this is time in months, so this is uh, 25 years, this is 50 years, this is 100 years, this is uh, uh, 200 years, OK? You can see exactly uh, things behaving exactly what, or as you might expect. If you only uh, are at four times CO2 for 25 years, you can relax back here uh, pretty quickly to uh, what might be a pre-industrial temperature record. If you do it at 100 years, it takes a little longer. Maybe you don't quite get there, because there might be some irreversible changes in the climate system, like the Amazon burning off or uh, losing its uh, uh, vegetation. If you wait for 200 years, you might not get completely back for the same reason other ecosystems start behaving. The interesting one is what happened when he tried it at 50 years. Okay? And at 50 years, you not only got down to the present, to the pre-industrial temperature record, but you overshot it considerably, and you're still overshooting it. And what happened uh, was this. This is the temperature difference between the two. Again, the North Atlantic is freezing, and the uh, overturning circulation is very low and doesn't recover very quickly. So um, Lab C is a very difficult place to model. Uh, 
because of all the, the many processes that go into it. Some of them are atmospheric circulation, which um, leads to clouds. But freezing the Labrador Sea is a relatively easy thing to do. And many climate models cl that are being used, that are used for IPCC uh, integrations have the, have the tendency to have almost frozen uh, or frozen completely frozen Labrador Sea. So I want to answer, I want to, I want to uh, end with a few questions. The question is, is we know climate models might be almost intransitive uh, because of this behavior of switching between a frozen North Atlantic and a, and a, um, a thawed North Atlantic. But is reality? Uh, the climate system almost intransitive. Could this happen at any time? Uh, since many climate models are almost intransitive, can we trust any long simulations? Because one of the difficulties is if, if the system is really almost intransitive, you never know if you sampled the system long enough uh, to actually go into multiple basins of attraction. And then we're doing climate change projections and predictions with these models. And uh, they're really pretty sensitive systems now that we've tried to incorporate in a number of different processes. So the question is, for climate change prediction, can we say anything meaningful about the future of climate, knowing that, indeed, at least one of the, the models uh, that we're using for climate change uh, predictions and assessments is uh, almost intransitive. So I'm going to end there and take any questions. So thank you. Well, first, I, I hope this wasn't recorded. But um, uh, is there any evidence that in the past the real laboratory C really froze? So, so there are, have been glaciations of the North Atlantic in, in the past, OK? And those have been thought to be driven by these uh, melt events that give you um, uh, uh, fresh water in the North Atlantic, and then that, that freezes by the same mechanism. So uh, during glaciation periods, there's probably some evidence. Uh, it's in the. Pre, from the, from the pre-industrial time to the present, which is a time we've been trying to to simulate the climate system, there have been no incidences of the Labrador Sea freezing. But if we have a very cold winter in the North Atlantic, we'll see see what happens one of these years. Yeah. Jeff is going to ask the same question. Yeah. I had a similar question, uh, particularly wanted to ask about the Younger Dryas and events like that. That's what you were alluding right. to. Right. Um, so I'll ask a different question then. So what is your perspective on, on the sensitivity of climate models to parameter tuning? Uh, my impression of some of the work with climateprediction.net was that they found that it was really hard to tune parameters that gave you realistic climates without um, getting a similar climate sensitivity. Does, so, does this, do these experiences make you rethink that conclusion? So, so climate.net, you could argue, um, used reasonable values for parameters, but not necessarily parameters that would give you Earth-like conditions, OK, in, in combination, because, again, we're talking about system behavior, and system behavior is the uh, turbulence that grows out of the individual turbulence chaos of, of, the, of the components and the processes going on. And so uh, uh, trying to tune a, 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 a climate system model to give you a reasonable climate is the exercise that we've been going through for two years beyond the time that we thought we were going to be doing it. So it took us three years longer, three years to go from CCSM, CESM1 to CESM2. 
to, which uh, had to do with all the, the bifurcations that, that the new physics that we put in uh, uh, permitted within the system. So one of the difficulties, as everyone uh, is aware, uh, bifurcations, even local bifurcations like these, local in space and time, uh, are not structurally stable. Uh, so if you change the system, you won't necessarily get the same behavior in that, in that area. And so uh, as we try to model the system more realistically, we build in more sensitivities than we know how to uh, handle at present. So. Suppose you lost the Greenland ice sheet very fast. Yes. Um, are you, does that change things? That makes it worse, actually, uh, if you think about it. So, um, yeah. So, uh, Greenland is right there, abutting the Labrador Sea, and if if you got a, a lot of melt water, it would be cold, but it would also be very, very fresh. It would freshen that, that part and uh, exacerbate things quickly. Okay, And so this is kind of the premise of, of uh, science fiction movies like The Day After Tomorrow, uh, but that happens much more quickly than we're talking about things happening. It takes several years just to try to adjust. Okay, Or 100 years in, in, in some of the adjustments that we've had. I have another question. Um, you mentioned how when you try to put more physical effects into the model, uh, there's new sensitivities and there's new interactions that can be unexpected. Is it possible that a simpler model is actually more predictive than these more complicated sure. models that were sure. coming I mean, now? I think w what happens is oftentimes when we put in more sensitivities, we don't understand uh, and and presumably better physically based parameterizations, uh, we don't often understand the fact that simpler physics, less uh, representative physical parameterizations, turbulence parameterizations, uh, for a climate system might be their errors might be, the inner errors in such simpler systems might be canceling out other system behavior errors that are happening. So basically tuning a climate model is uh, trying to find compensating errors for everything else, everything else, everything else is doing. And so that's, that's why uh, tuning the system behavior of any complex chaotic system is a challenging task. And you're never quite sure what kind of sensitivity you're going to get. Now the, the question is, what, what, what are we missing that ought to be in other processes that was canceling out some of, some of this behavior? Because it's really dubious that the real system is as sensitive to aerosol loading as the NCAR system is right now. <laughs> 